Let's take a look at isolated DC to DC converters, what they are, when you would want to use them, and let's try a few circuit configurations with one. An isolated DC to DC converter will take a DC voltage in, go through a DC to AC inverter, which will send pulses to this transformer at a certain number of kilohertz, generating an AC voltage in the secondary winding, which is then rectified back into DC, so you end up with a DC in and an isolated DC out. So this allows two separate circuits to interact where, for example, their grounds may not be at the same potential, so you can't directly connect them. This can also be used to help minimize or eliminate ground loops because you're not tying grounds together between sections. It can be used for safety requirements, for example, medical applications, or helping maintain a person's safety from accidental current flow. Looking at some app notes about isolation, we can get some ideas about when and why we'd want to do it. This one from Data Translation regarding USB measurements on a computer. They mention several good reasons you may want to provide isolation at some point between two parts of a circuit or system. One would be ESD hits, which I've experienced before in a test setup where the device under test had moving parts and it was generating static electricity all the time, so there were always ESD events. And it was causing the computer running the tests to reboot, so we actually had to implement opto-isolation. Another good reason to isolate, especially if you're doing testing on multiple units and one could be miswired, you end up with a hazardous voltage or just a certain voltage that the circuitry can't tolerate, and it will cause damage, the damage should be limited to one side of an isolation barrier and not cause the whole system to get damaged. Also, ground loops can be eliminated by not having all the grounds tied together. So if you have something that can pick up noise, like long cables or something else, where noise can couple into a part of a system, it can possibly propagate over to another part of the system that you'd like to be clean. So you separate your power connections and data connections, and the noise can only get so far through your system. Similarly, if you have common mode noise, one good example in a typical circuit board design might be a mixed analog and digital system, or anything inductive, you're driving motors or solenoids, you might have back EMF spikes, noise coupling into the power supply, you could get voltage spikes, ground bounce, so you can keep all of this noisy environment on one side of an isolation barrier and keep the other side isolated and stable. Analog Devices talks about the RS-485 communication in DMX lighting applications. DMX is a digital interface between controllers and lighting equipment mostly and accessories and this uses RS-485 differential data. DMX-512 requires isolation to protect expensive lighting equipment from harmful current surges. Here's an example of an isolated receiver. On schematics, an isolation barrier is typically represented by a dashed line running through to separate both sides of this barrier. At the top here we would have an isolated power supply, so we have an input voltage, some circuitry to pulse this transformer, then on the other side of the transformer where it's isolated we rectify it back to DC and if we wish, we can add a linear regulator, get a more clean power source. And likewise, any data coming across the barrier in either direction will go through opto-isolators. So if this right side is some expensive equipment, and the left side has this communication data cable running for a long distance, and it can pick up all kinds of noise or even have voltage and current spikes on it, this isolation barrier helps keep everything clean on the receiver side and anything harmful over on the outside world. This is the DC to DC isolated converter I have on hand. It's an 0505, so it takes 5 volts DC in and gives an isolated 5 volts DC out. It can do up to 200 milliamps, and it needs to be loaded with at least 20 milliamps to run correctly so either the circuit being powered has to always draw more than 20 milliamps or else you can put a load resistor to make sure you're always drawing at least 20 milliamps. 
The efficiency on this one can be 76 to 80 percent, and the load capacitance on the output can only go up to 220 micro. This one is not regulated, so depending on your load current, the output voltage may fluctuate. So you'd have to make sure you look at the data sheets for various converters and make sure they can do what you want. So if we wanted maybe an isolated 3.3 volt supply that had to be well regulated, we could use this 5 volt in to 5 volt out unregulated converter and then use that unregulated to go into a 3.3 volt LDO and get a stable 3.3 volts out. This top circuit is a representation of the test setup I have. So I have three AA batteries giving me about 4.5 volts. It's actually a little less because these three AA batteries aren't so fresh. I have two identical boost converters. One is adjusted to give plus 5 out. The other gives plus 18 out. So I'm taking this plus 5, putting it into this DC to DC isolated converter, getting isolated floating 5 volts out. So these bottom circuits represent a few experiments. The way these boost converters are designed, the minus input from the battery goes to the minus input of each of these converters, and that minus input on each converter I represented going straight through to the minus output terminal with a dotted line. So really this minus on this 5 volts out and the minus on the 18 volts out, it's all connected. You could probe continuity straight through any of these minus terminals. But over here, this minus output on the isolated converter, this does not connect anywhere else. This is isolated fully with a transformer. So I can treat this as if I have a 5 volt battery and I can throw it in series with this input 5 volts if I want and give myself 10 volts like I've drawn here. I can get a plus 10 by connecting my input 5 volts in series with my floating output 5 volts as if it's just a battery and I stack it in series with this. Or if I take that center junction, call it ground, relative to this ground I can get a plus 5 out or a minus 5 out. Another experiment, if I take this 18 volt supply and then use my floating 5 volt source, I can take the floating 5 volts, put it in series with the 18 and get plus 23. But I could also reverse the polarity on here. Since it's floating, I can put positive or negative wherever I want. So if I reverse this, what I'm doing is subtracting 5 volts from 18 and probing here to ground, I get 13 volts instead of 23. Here's the 5 volt in, 5 volt out, isolated DC to DC converter along with the datasheet recommended input and output filter capacitors, and I have a 200 ohm resistor loading the output so I can have about 25 milliamps of load current at all times, where the datasheet suggests we need at least 20 milliamps of load for this to work properly. I have three AA batteries giving me a 4.5 volt supply that I'm feeding into a boost regulator, and that's also feeding into a second boost regulator. The main battery voltage is about 4.2 volts. I have it set to give 5 volts out, and that's powering the isolated DC to DC converter. So those wires come over here. Here's the output wires of the DC to DC, but I'll just probe down on the breadboard. The input from the boost converter is 4.99. It's 5 volts. Then if I move over, the output is also 4.99, 5 volts. So now I can take these output wires, just to confirm everything's plugged in. We got our 5 volts. This is 5 volts isolated, so there's no common ground with anything else. And I can do some experiments with this. So here there's an extra pair of wires coming from the battery source over to this other boost converter. And I have this set for 18 volts out, just to do some more experiments. So that's still set for 18. Aside from the isolated output, all of these other power sources, the batteries and the two non-isolated converters, they all share a common ground. So I can probe this ground on the input of the isolated converter, just as an easy way to probe over here. And I can probe the positive output of this 18 volts, and I have a complete circuit path. So that's what we mean by it's not isolated. The grounds are common. I can probe the positive of the battery using the same ground. 
and I get my 4.2 volts for the battery, and obviously I'm using the ground from the output of this so I can probe its VCC and get my 5 volts. But I can't probe the plus 5 out of the isolated and get anything, because it's not common ground. You can't get anything until you actually probe both positive and minus isolated outputs as one circuit. So this is kind of like a floating 5 volt battery that I can do what I want with, ground it however I want, because ground is just a reference, it doesn't mean 0 volts. I can take one of these and connect it to plus 18 volts and just call that my ground if I want. Looking at the scope, first just looking at the input, we have our 5 volts in, looking at any minor spikes. Uh, the scope is showing a couple of hundred millivolts. So if I AC couple and zoom in on that, there's all of our stuff coming out of our switching regulator to give us our 5 volts into the isolated converter. Just as a reference for what's going in versus what's coming out. The battery pack itself, average 25 millivolts of little spikes here and there. Now I'll hook up to the output of the DC to DC. So on the AC ripple measurement, we still have our same couple of hundred millivolt spikes. If I go back to DC coupled, bring it back on screen, there's our 5 volts out, and it looks like around 500 millivolts of spikes here. So if we say this is actual legitimate noise that would be in our system, and we're not just picking up stuff from other equipment being on, this may be okay, but if you need a more clean source, you would get a DC to DC converter that's a little higher than you need, and then you would use an LDO to get a more clean, linear, regulated voltage supply. Overall, it seems to be working quite well. So to demonstrate connecting this floating 5 volts in series with the actual input 5 volts to create a 10 volt, the first two pins here would be ground and plus 5 in. Then I have ground and plus 5 floating. So I'm going to consider this input 5 volt source as my final circuit ground. So I'll take the minus of the 5 volts out, connect it to the plus 5 in, put this overall final ground. So now I have ground and plus 5 in, connecting to minus out, and my final plus 5 out, now I have two 5 volts in series, 9.99, I have 10 volts out. Or, keeping that same setup, if I simply move what I'm going to consider my ground over to the junction between the 5 volts in and the 5 volts out, now relative to this center node, I have plus 5 out and I have minus 5 out, so I've created a split rail supply that I could use for an op amp or something like that. Double checking, I still have 18 volts on this boost converter. So if I want to create something a little higher than 18 volts, if I consider the minus of the 18 as my overall ground, then I have plus 18. Well, I can add this plus 5 in series, so I take this minus terminal of 5 volts, and now it's as if I took an 18 volt battery and a 5 volt battery, stuck them in series, and I'm going to probe overall between the ground of 18 and this floating 5. Now I got 23, 18 plus 5 volts. But you can also turn this floating 5 volts backwards and you'll get a subtraction. So if I want something a little less than 18 volts for part of my circuit, I can connect the positive of my floating 5 to the positive 18. Now I've connected a smaller battery backwards in series with a bigger 18 volt battery. So if I probe again from the main 18 volt ground and my negative 5 out, I get 18 minus 5, or a 13 volt supply. I can do this because both the positive and negative are floating, they're not referenced with any other part of the circuit. There's a few neat things you can do with a floating isolated DC to DC converter. Whether you need noise immunity, safety isolation, or you just need to combine supplies in some creative way to give you plus and minus rails, or boost a little higher, or go a little lower than some other main rail for your system, this is one way to do it. Any questions, comments, or other ideas that you've used or figure we could use these types of regulators for, comment below. See you on the next video.